Good morning. Good morning and welcome to this morning's worship service. Very special welcome to you if you are a visitor or a guest with us today. And if you are a first time visitor, we'd love to be able to welcome you more formally if you'd be willing to uh, stand up and introduce yourself. We don't require that, more of a request, but do we have any first time visitors with us this morning? I'm going to turn your attention to your bulletin while I do that. Uh, those of you sitting in the pews closest to the Burgundy worship folders, I would invite you to go ahead and take those out and begin to put your information in there. Just a reminder that in the folders also are the prayer request slips, so if you have a prayer need, go ahead and fill one of those out. Hang on to it, and then as you leave worship this morning, there by the front doors, there's a box on a pedestal with praying hands on it. You can put your prayer requests in there. They'll be gathered by our prayer ministers and prayed over throughout the week. Also, if you would like some private prayer time with one of our prayer ministers, then at the conclusion of today's service, just gather here at the altar rail closest to the pulpit. Someone will pray with you there. Um, inside your bulletin, you um, may have found one of these um, cards with Psalm uh, 91 uh, 4 on it. Uh, these are praise uh, cards, and if you look in your bulletin on page two at the very top, it explains that uh, we have a bulletin board across the hall from the offices uh, where we're inviting people to uh, think about ways in which they've had prayers answered and want to give praise to God or certain things that happened in their life. They want to lift up and give God praise, and uh, we're asking the people who feel comfortable doing that uh, writing about that on the card, uh, giving God thanks and praise, and then 
pinning those to the board uh, by the office there. Um, let's see, re uh, remembering in prayer, we want to lift up in prayer those known to have been hospitalized, in particular uh, uh, Bill Ellis. On uh, page, the back of your bulletin, I'll flip you there to page 11. Just a reminder that we are now officially in the church season of Lent. Just as Advent is the several weeks leading up to the celebration of the birth of our Savior, Lent is the several week period leading up to um, um, you know, the, the events of Holy Week and uh, the resurrection of our Savior. Both are times of preparation. I'll be talking about that more in my sermon today. But just a reminder that we will have midweek worship services throughout Lent on Wednesday evenings at 7 o'clock. We have a number of uh, former pastors, uh, retired pastors who are going to be sharing messages with us. And since 2018 is the year of prayer here at, um, at American Lutheran Church, our focus this year will be on the various petitions of the Lord's Prayer. So uh, hope you find that meaningful. A lot of other stuff in there, uh, Lenten food drive, uh, all kinds of things about that in there. Uh, other things that are coming up, um, I want to encourage you to read through your bulletin carefully. Um, but uh, altar flowers today, Jackie Sexton, in memory of husband Jerry. So thank you, Jackie, for our altar flowers. That's all I'm going to lift up at this time. Um, I invite you now to stand as you are able and we'll quiet our minds from the busyness of uh, whatever is going on in our life. We'll center our hearts and prepare to come into the worship of our Lord. Welcome this first Sunday in Lent. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of heaven and earth, you come, you came in close and make us yours. Equip us for your spirit to confess our sin, embrace your forgiveness, and seek the way you set before us in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. With honesty of heart, let us confess our sin. Merciful God, forgive us. Our will is handcuffed to sin, and we cannot break free. We have spoken when we should have kept quiet. We were silent when we should have said something. We acted when we knew better. We were still when we know we should have moved. For the wrong we have done, for the good we have failed to do, have mercy on us. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, amen. People of God, look to the Son given to heal you and set you free because God loved so loved the world. Take hold of life, eternal life. <clears throat> Thank you. 
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. together. Holy God, Heavenly Father, in the waters of the flood you saved the chosen, and in the wilderness of temptation you protected your Son from sin. Renew us in the gift of baptism. May your holy angels be with us, that the wicked foe may have no power on the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The reading this morning is from 1 Peter, chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as the removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers, having been subjected to him. The word of the Lord. gospel on this first Sunday in the church season of Lent comes from Mark the first chapter. Now in those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. And when Jesus came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove Jesus out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And Jesus was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now after John the Baptist was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please be 
seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. I met, uh, I met Gloria shortly after I arrived at my first call. It was probably the fall of 1993. Um, I was serving at a Atonement Lutheran Church in Billings, Montana. Uh, Gloria was a woman in her mid-80s. And um, to be honest with you, she had to be one of the most negative people I have ever met in my life. I mean, Gloria had the unique ability to find the cloud in every silver lining. And for Gloria, the cup was never half full. It was always at best half empty. Maybe you know someone like that. Maybe that's you, I don't know. But after a particularly frustrating home visit with Gloria, I decided that she might benefit from some theological reflection on the Old Testament book of Job. So that week, I jumped into my sermon preparation with enthusiastic vigor. And the result of my efforts, the result was a hermeneutical masterpiece. Or in layman's terms, I wrote a really great sermon. And this sermon was so great, this sermon was going to transform Gloria's life. It was going to be a life and faith changing event for her. It was going to fill Gloria with all kinds of newfound optimism and hope. And did I mention to you this was my first call? <laughs> so Sunday arrived and my sermon was honed to perfection. Ah, the preacher was willing. And the object of my considerable attention, Gloria, Gloria was nowhere to be found. <laughs> no, evidently, Gloria decided to skip church that Sunday. And I was stunned. And I was frustrated because I didn't understand how God could let such a thing happen, such a wonderful opportunity go by. I would, of course, now have to preach that sermon anyway, but it wasn't going to be the same. You know, not with, you know, with Gloria not being there to soak up the wonder of it all. And that's when the miracle happened. By Thursday of the following week, I had received three phone calls from people who wondered if I had written that sermon just for them. None of them, of course, by the name of Gloria. And suddenly a scripture came to my mind uh, from Isaiah chapter 55. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and it shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. And the I there could be underlined because the I is God speaking, and so basically saying that God's word will accomplish what God wills, not necessarily what the preacher wills. And I learned a valuable lesson that week. I learned that when it comes to sermons, more often than not, God works his will. God works his purpose in spite of my personal agenda. You see, I had an agenda that Sunday, and so did God. And in the end, it was God's agenda that won out for his glory to accomplish his will just the way he had planned it all along. And so I decided then and there, early on in my ministry, that I was going to alter my understanding of sermon writing. 
uh, as I've shared with many of you before, um, if you ask me about my sermons, uh, I'll tell you that I write my sermons for me. And hopefully you get something out of it. Um, and so I, I've tried to, over the years, I've tried to resist this temptation that so many of us preachers get all the time. This temptation that I have to try to figure out what each of you needs to get out of a particular sermon. And instead now I try to allow God's word to speak directly to me. And then I trust that the sermon will also speak to some of you in a special way. For instance, if, if I'm preaching on a particular Sunday about greed, or maybe I'm preaching on forgiveness, or, or preaching on spiritual discipline, the truth is it's, it's most likely that God is trying to minister to me in those areas concerning a particular issue as I write the sermon. So if you feel like I've written that sermon on greed just for you, chances are you're wrong. Chances are it's, it's an issue I'm dealing with in my life that, that God is trying to speak to me. And this has been a complicated way of, of my trying to explain where today's sermon came from. You see, I, interestingly, I found myself sitting at my desk over the past a couple of weeks as I look forward to the, the, the various scripture readings and what's coming up. And I found myself kind of slipping back into that old temptation. And I was asking myself, Lord, what do they need to hear from you this Lent? What do they need to hear from you? And, and the answer that came back to me was, Jack, what do you need to hear from me? And I thought about that, and, and I prayed about that, and, and I, I started thinking, what do I need to hear to get me motivated to take this opportunity that God has given me called Lent and to make it more meaningful in my life for the coming weeks? And after some prayerful thought, I figured out that what I most need at this moment in my spiritual walk is that I need to be challenged in regard to my personal plans for this year's Lenten journey. You see, we are entering into that 40-day period of Lent, this period of several weeks that is like Advent, like I said, Advent, a time of spiritual preparation for the celebration of the birth of our Savior. So Lent is this period of time as we do spiritual preparation, as we look forward to the observances of Holy Week and the celebration of Easter. I've mentioned with you, to you many times how frustrating it can be for Christians that, uh, you know, a lot of Christians, all they ever get is Christmas, Easter, Christmas, Easter, Christmas, Easter. If that's all you've ever experienced, well, that's wonderful. It's two of the most, you know, powerful moments in the gospel. But how can you celebrate the joy of Easter until you've experienced the horror of the cross? I mean, there's just, it's all meant to be part of the longer story. And, and Lent is, is, is really an opportunity for us to come to grips with the cross so that when Easter arrives, it really has some meaning in our lives. And, and so we enter this 40-day period of Lent. And if you count the numbers up, you're going to find out it doesn't add up to 40 days because the truth of the matter is uh, we never count Sundays in Lent. Um, Lent, uh, Sundays are always feast days. Sundays are always the celebration of the resurrection, which always kind of drove me crazy in seminary because I always said, well, during Lent, you're going to change this part of the liturgy and that part of the liturgy, and, and why don't we tone down the songs a little bit and, 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 and make everything a little bit more, you know, dismal and gray and all that. And and, and yet, right there in the rubrics as, that we learn in seminary is Sundays are not part of Lent. So, I mean, it's sort of like, it's, it's not only ironic, it's hypocritical. 
So um, I've always been one of those pastors who, who said, no, nope, let's, you know, Sunday is Sunday. We're going to celebrate. We're going to uh, immerse ourselves in the joy of the resurrection because uh, we got all this other time to sit around and feel bad about our sins. So I'm just saying if you're giving up chocolate for Lent or, or whiskey or whatever, go for it on Sundays, you know? <laughs> But Monday through Saturday, you know, you got to pull back. So we enter this 40-day period of Lent, this, this time of spiritual preparation. We look forward to the observances of Holy Week, you know, of, of, of you know, Passion Sunday, uh, Palm Sunday, of, of Monday Thursday and Good Friday, and then eventually the celebration of Easter. And it just seems that I... Pastors in particular, but I, and I church workers, but a lot of people. I just get so busy this time of year. There's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of extra services and first communion classes and a lot of other different things that are going on this time of year. And I, I can tend to get so busy and so wrapped up in all these different things that are going on that it seems that Lent just kind of comes and goes. And, and I haven't really come to grips with what's going on. And sometimes maybe what I get out of Lent is uh, a, a couple soup supper recipes and a lot of stress, you know. And I know that if I'm a pastor and that's happening to me, that in all likelihood it's probably happening to a lot of you too. That, that Lent is just going to kind of blow by and... and and it, it may not be any different than any other time of the year. And I, and I just think that's sad, too bad. Because it really is a gift to us that God has given us. It is this opportunity. So today I'm going to give myself some good advice. I'm going to give myself a little spiritual pep talk. Uh, I really wanted to point the finger at all of you, but God would have no part of it. However, I'm just suggesting that if you listen closely, maybe, just maybe, you might hear God speaking to you in my spiritual pep talk. And I know the first thing that I need to do if I'm going to make the most out of this particular Lenten season is I need to sit down and really re-examine what Lent is this, you know, and why I should be observing um, this time of Lent in the first place. And I need to remind myself that this is indeed a time of spiritual preparation. That it is indeed an opportunity, a blessing that God has given me in order that I can prepare my heart and prepare my mind for the brutality of the cross and for the joy of the resurrection. You know, in many ways, Lent is like confession before worship. I don't know if you've ever noticed it all these years you've been, you know, coming and worshiping, especially by the Lutheran tradition or Catholic tradition or others. But have you ever noticed we always start out with confession? Have you ever, if, if you've noticed it, have you ever wondered why that is that we open up on Sunday mornings with confession. Well, the idea is, is that before we enter into the worship of our Lord, we should probably do a little house cleaning from the week before, you know? Um, lift up before God, uh, you know, the sort of our, our, our impure brokenness and, and let God offer up his word of forgiveness to us. And then, then we're more ready to enter into the joy of worship. Well, that's what Lent is. It's, a, it's an opportunity for us to come to grips with um, who we really are. It's a, it's a time for some spiritual house cleaning before we enter into the Easter celebration. Uh, I'll just give you an example. Let's imagine that I'm, I've been presented with a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And I'm going to go to Ireland, the Emerald Isle, for 10 days. And uh, I get to pick, of course, uh, the time of year that I'm going to go on this vacation. And of course, uh, I also get to choose whatever sites are it is that I want to go and see. So what will I do? 
Well, uh, there's a couple things I could do. I could just, you know, buy a plane ticket haphazardly, fly over there and just wing it. Um, but that's not my style, you know. Um, no, if I've got 10 days, I'm going to do research. I'm going to get on the internet. I'm going to find out when the weather is the best in Ireland. What's the best time of year to go there? I don't want to get socked into 10 days of rain. Okay, so I'm going to pick what's the best time to go. And then I'm going to maybe do some research about what are the top 10, top 15, you know, touristy things to do in Ireland. And I'm going to, you know, to kind of start to, to, to check my boxes. and Because the thing about it is I want to get the most out of this once in a lifetime opportunity. Well, Lent is a little bit like, like taking a trip to Ireland in a, in a way. If I want to get the most out of my season of land. If I want to get the most out of Holy Week, and especially if I want to get the most out of my Easter experience, it would probably serve me well to do a little bit of research before I get there. So that when I finally do arrive at Holy Week and Easter, I will be able to more fully experience and understand and rejoice in that moment. Now when I think of uh, research and Lent, three words come to my mind. And those three words are discipline, inventory, and repentance. Discipline. What does discipline have to do with Lent? Well, now I'm speaking for myself because I wanted to write the sermon for you, but that God would have no part of that. So, so speaking for myself, Discipline is training myself in the areas of moral obedience and self-control in my life. I, I think of it this way. Let's say it's a beautiful summer day, and I have a hole in my roof. Now, rain is forecast for tomorrow. In fact, rain is forecast for the next five days. So I have today off. It's the only day I can go fishing. And it is a beautiful day. It's a glorious day. It's a perfect day to go fishing. But I have a hole in my roof. So what am I going to do? Well, if I decide to go fishing, then I'm leading an undisciplined life. Because I'm putting my desires before my needs and responsibilities. What I really need to do is get that roof fixed because I got five days of rain coming. But it's, a, it's amazing how, how many of us choose to go fishing rather than fix our roof, right? It's, it's, it's amazing how much our personal desires and wants run our life more than our needs and responsibilities. So uh, if I'm focusing on my needs and responsibilities, I'm leading a disciplined life. If I'm focusing on my wants and desires, I'm leading an undisciplined life. And the temptation I always face is that I would rather do what I want instead of what God needs me to do. And Lent is my God-given opportunity for a little discipline in my life. I want to just blow it off, not deal with it. Um, but what God is saying is, no, Jack, this is what you need to do. You need this time to prepare your spiritual inventory, which is the second thing uh, I'm talking about, inventory. So first, discipline, and that comes first because I don't do the inventory without the discipline. Now, spiritual inventory doesn't sound like much fun to most people. And in reality, if we do it right, it probably isn't a lot of fun. And that's why it takes discipline to do a spiritual inventory. Because I would rather fill myself up with the busyness of the day than to sit down and do a serious examining of all of the sin in my life. Um, oh, and, and you know, I understand that Jesus died for my sins. 
And I, and I understand that it was my sins that nailed Jesus to the cross. It's just that I'm not so sure I want to know exactly what those sins are. I'm much more comfortable with just saying, I'm a sinner, my sins killed Jesus, blah, 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 blah. What's a lot harder, and what God wants me to do, is to get into the details of my broken, rebellious life, because Jesus died for some very specific sins in my life. Okay? And so it would probably, I mean, the least I could do since he died for those specific sins is kind of kind of do some work to figure out what those specific sins are. And, and why? Well, because um, I'm going to need to, at some point, we're going to get to the next word, which is repentance. And in order for me to really do the repentance, I need to get to the specifics of the sin, which is where the spiritual inventory comes in. The only way I will ever be able to really get a handle on my sin is to go through the process of making a thorough spiritual inventory. So, this year I have decided this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to set aside two hours. Now, two hours does not sound like much. Just try it though, okay? I'm going to set aside two hours. And in those two hours, I plan on taking out a pen and paper, and I'm going to write down on that piece of paper a list of the seven deadly sins. It's kind of a random thought this year, but this is how I'm going to do it. So I'm going to write down the word pride, the word envy, the word anger, the word sloth, laziness, the word lust, the word greed, the word gluttony. And then in each of those categories, I plan to list three, four, five, whatever I come up with, th five ways that I have allowed, specific ways that I have allowed that particular sin to disrupt my relationship with my neighbor or my family and, and ways I've allowed that specific sin to disrupt my relationship with God. So I could pick sloth. I could pick laziness. How has my laziness interfered with my relationship with my family? Okay, I have, I have my Doris duties like everybody else, right? Um, in my house, um, I clean toilets, that's a long story, <laughs> and, uh, and I vacuum, okay? So um, those, I have to do that every week. And I'd really love to tell you the story behind the toilets, but I'm not going to. Um, and, 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 you know, if I don't do that, and I just blow that off, then what that does is, you know, if it gets, starts to look, if I blow it off for a couple weeks, then that puts Luann in a very uncomfortable position of having to say, the toilets look like heck. It's, it's your job. So now she's got she's to mother me, right? She's got she's to go to all the trouble of telling me to do the things I need to do. She doesn't want to be my mother. She wants to be my wife. That interferes with my relationship. When I dodge my responsibilities, or she dodges her responsibilities, it affects other people around. You see where I'm going with this stuff? The second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to write down the word idolatry. And I'm going to identify the top four or five things that I have continually placed before my relationship with God. Remember the commandment, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me. And anything that is a greater priority in our life than our relationship with God becomes or has, uh, threatens to become an idol in our life. And it affects our relationship with God. And so I need to come to grips with that. Because the more I focus on those things, the less I'm focusing on God. And finally then, what I plan to do is I'm going to take these lists and I am going to be disciplined and I am going to go to a quiet place and I am going to lift up before God all the sordid details of my spiritual inventory that I've taken time. All the specific details. And I am going to confess those to God. 
come to grips with them, and I'm going to ask God to forgive me and to create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. That's spiritual discipline and, and, or spiritual inventory, and it takes discipline. The, the third piece is, is this piece of repentance. Now, for me, it's not enough for me to say, these are my sins, and here they are, God, and will you forgive me? Because I know God will forgive me, but God also said, as he said to the adulterous woman who came to him and said, do, do, you know, do I condemn you? And do they, where are your, those who condemn you? And they're not there. And he says, I don't condemn you either. But he says, but go and sin no more. In other words, you don't get to continue going on, you know, just admitting your sins and living the same kind of life. There's some expectations here. The expectation is there's going to be some change. And that's what repentance is. Repentance is another word that has to do with Lent. It's being disciplined to take that spiritual inventory, that list of my sins that I've asked God forgiveness for, and I'm going to then take the step of saying, what ways do I need, or what do I, specific things do I need to do in order to remove this sinfulness from my life? So that I'm not continuing to do the same stupid things all over again. Because if I want God to renew me, then I've got to be a participant in that. And I've got to help out. And I've got to make some changes. Now, I, I guarantee you this year's Lenten journey is not going to be a lot of fun. In all this discipline, all this spiritual inventory stuff, all this repentance. But the truth is... I know that there is a storm raging all around me. And that storm isn't always apparent, but that storm is threatening to destroy my spiritual house. The spiritual house that God has given me. And Lent is my opportunity to take some time to build the foundation of my spiritual house so that it will withstand the wind, the rain, the flood, and the test of time. And God has given me this opportunity before the storm if I'm willing to take it. Now, of course, I mentioned earlier, this sermon was written for me. It may not have anything at all to do with any of you. I'm back to finger pointing, aren't I? But in all seriousness, please, please take this opportunity that the season of Lent is affording you. Take this opportunity for self-examination and for repentance. Don't let another year go by without knowing the joy, the real joy of a thorough spiritual soul cleansing that Lent wants to offer you. Don't let another year go by without fully acknowledging that it is your sin and it's some very specific sins on your part that have sent Jesus to the cross on your behalf. Don't spend another year without fully experiencing the joy of knowing not only how loved and forgiven you are, but how much God wants to change you for his glory and for your joy. So I want to encourage all of you. Um, you know, may, maybe you want to take the bulletin insert home with you. I don't, I don't know if you want to follow my, my path or if you want to do something completely different for Lent, but, but do something disciplined. Uh, do an inventory. Get serious about it. Put some time aside. Take the time this Lenten season to repair your relationship with God. I'm sure you'll be glad you did. Right, Gloria? Yeah. And now may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, keep our hearts and our minds one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Um, I'm going to invite you to go ahead and stand as you are able. Uh, we will sing our hymn of the day, Jesus Still Lead On. That's number 341.
Let us pray together the words of our faith in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born on the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Renewed in the promises of baptism, let us pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Lord God, you are the healer of our every ill. We know that which hurts us most is when we allow our sin-sick souls to fester and grow into out-of-control behaviors that harm ourselves and others. We ask you to cleanse our hearts and minds, for out of our hearts and minds come things that can never be taken back. So this season, we ask you to help us reflect on all those things that we can do, to honestly confess and willingly turn from sin in order to draw into your Sabbath rest with peace in our hearts, peace in our homes, and peace in our world. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of infinite mercy, first we ask for healing for Bill Ellis, who has been hospitalized, and all in our church family suffering from illness. Then we ask you to send your comforting spirit to all those who are affected by the school shooting in Florida. We know that you mourn with us over the loss and the harm done by yet another evil act of violence. Help us to be more aware of people on the fringe that are in need of healing in mind and spirit. Awaken our innermost beings and quicken our desire to share your love in abundance to all. Lay on each of our hearts, here and now, someone who needs your healing touch and our prayers for their benefit. Lord, in your mercy, Author and perfecter of our faith, restore our nation and give our leaders a sincere desire to serve with integrity. Help them lead the way in creating a country that listens to you above all the noise of dissent. Hear us when we, as a body of believers, cry out to you for forgiveness. Help us to fight the spiritual battle for the souls of our youth through prayers of intercession and by example, showing them God-honoring behavior. We sincerely want to raise up our children to be godly men and women who hear your call in their lives. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Trusting in your covenant of mercy, O God, we lift our prayers to you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. The peace of the Lord be with all of you.
Let us pray. O merciful God, receive the sacrifice of our praise and thanksgiving and the offering of our lives, that following in the way of the cross, we may know the joy of the resurrection through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, broke it, and then he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Then again after supper, he took the cup. Again he gave thanks. Then he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And so we pray that prayer that our Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Return to the Lord your God with all your heart. Receive bread for the journey, and drink for the desert.